How's everybody doing? I'm so glad you guys are here. Thanks for joining us. You know, last week we started a brand new series called Fresh Start, how to start the new year off right, and I am excited to get going right away. I'm excited about the things I want to tell you today. Pull out your notes. Would you do that? I want to say hello to all of our campuses. Thanks for being a part of our services today. I want to take a moment to say a special hello real quick to the Northwest campus, if I can. You know, Northwest, you guys are going through a lot of changes, a lot of stuff's going on right now. I'm really proud of Pastor Byron. He is just hanging in there through all these changes, leading you guys. I just want to stop and say, when you see construction going on, that's a good sign. When things are messy, it's because it's about to be really nice and new. Let's give it up for our Northwest campus. Can we do that real quick? Proud of you guys. Keep up the great work. I want to challenge all of our campuses to keep inviting your friends, bringing people. That's what we're about, is about reaching people for Christ. That's why we upgrade campuses. That's why we buy them and, and try to, you know, make them nice, that kind of thing. Because the Bible says clearly in Scripture, it says, overlay everything with gold. Did you know that? It, all, all the time you seem to take something old and overlay it with gold and make it holy. That just means take whatever God's given you, make it as nice as you can, and use it for the Lord. And so overlaying with gold doesn't mean opulence. It means excellence. And so that's what we want to do here. And so I'm really proud of of our Northwest campus. So that's what we're doing right now. We're just overlaying everything, taking that old building and making it nice and new. And so it's good stuff. So guys, thanks for being here. I want to talk today about going pro. I want to challenge you with this message called Go Pro. I don't mean the GoPro you attach to your head when you're skiing. I don't mean that. Those are great. I love those little cameras. Those are really cool. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how God wants you to go pro in everything that you do. See, a professional is someone who does things at another level. A professional is someone who does things faster and better at the same time. That's why they're a pro, because they can do it amazing and do it really well the first time, right and quick, all at the same time. You see, I could play in the NFL. I have no doubt that I could. I just need everyone to slow down. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> If they'll just slow down, I don't have a problem with this, right? Everyone who goes from the college level to the pro level says, that w when they ask them, what's the biggest difference? They say everyone is so much faster. They can't believe how fast everyone is in the pros. Going from high school to college is, is just life-altering speeds. Then going from college to pros, blow your mind. I mean, it's just incredible how fast everyone is. But not only are they fast, but they're excellent. Not only can the receiver run the route perfectly, but he'll always catch the ball. Not only can the quarterback throw the ball perfectly, but he can throw it on a dime. I mean, it's incredible how fast they can throw that ball. It's like a rocket attached to a string. It's incredible how they do that. See, that's how you know you're a pro. A pro is someone that not only, who doesn't get, not only do they get paid for what they do, they built routines around what they do. Their life revolves around that they have been every part of their being into this one activity, and that's why we call them pros. And I believe God is leading you and I to go pro in our lives. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is a life we have, and so either you're going to make it count or you're not. And so it's time for you and I to begin to go pro in every area of our lives. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. I'm excited today, guys. I really believe that this content can change your life. I'm convinced that what we're going to share about in the next few minutes really can completely make 2015 the best year of your life. I'm really convinced of this, and so God's put this on my heart to give to you, and so please hear this as a word from God specifically for you today. Check this out. It says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will, that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. Now, he just jumped from running to boxing, right? So clearly the issue is not, we're not talking about running, we're not talking about boxing. We're talking about the principles that runners and boxers have in common, which is that they're both pros. They're both athletes. They see themselves as set apart for something more important than your average, everyday, uh, run-of-the-mill person is living their lives. It says this. It says, I'm not just shadow boxing. I'm disciplining my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So he compares a professional runner and a professional boxer to being a professional preacher. I mean, you're thinking, what? How in the world do those three things go together? I mean, clearly I know I, I look like a boxer. I mean, you know, no one got that. I don't understand. That's, <laughs> no one picked up on that. So here's the thing. It doesn't seem to go together, right? It seems a little odd. See, we look at athletes and think, oh, wow, they're just so amazing. And look at their bodies, their incredible shape, and their training, and their way they eat, and their nutrition. I mean, everything is just so on top of their game. I mean, to be a pro, to be the best, it's very inspiring to watch that. But that should be exactly what it looks like when people watch you selling used cars, when people watch you on the base, when people watch you as a teacher, when people watch you as an insurance salesman, when people watch you working as a nurse. In other words, God wants all of us to take what we do to a pro level. 
Does that make sense? That's what the scripture is clearly teaching us. He wants all of us to play at that level with what we do. So I want to challenge you with this. Would you write this down? Number one is just to go pro. But that means go proactive. We have to get past living in the reactive mode and start going proactive. You know, psychologists tell us that we either live in cause or we live in effect. To live in effect means that we're reactive. It means when we hear that the economy's down, we think, well, the economy's down, so I guess my income's going to be lower this year. You know, the economy's down, so I'm probably going to sell less product than I normally do. I just need to lower my expectations and just kind of lower my skill level with it because that's just the economy's down. No, that's an effect. Be in cause that says, well, that may be what the economists say, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work harder because I'm going to have causation and it's going to cause my sales to go up, which is going to cause my income to go up. It's going to cause me to be uh, the, the runner-up for the next big position, the next opportunity, because I'm going to be at cause, not living at effect. Which one do you live at? Are you living in reactive mode, or are you living in causation mode where you say, I'm going to cause my life to be better. I'm going to cause my marriage to improve by loving my spouse at another level. I'm going to cause my parenting to be better by getting involved in my kid's life. I'm going to cause my walk with God to be better by always being at church, honoring God, getting in His Word, and praying. I'm are you going to live in effect or are you going to live at cause? Which one would you like to do today? I would much rather live at cause. Somebody better get fired up because I'm trying to get you fired up right now. God wants you living at cause. We either, everything in life is cause and effect. Everything is. The Bible says this very clearly. That, that what we do, it's either sowing or reaping. What you, if you don't like your life today, you sowed it. So if you want to change your life, sow something new, and you'll get a new result. But if you, it's crazy to think you're going to get a better life if you don't do anything different. We've got to do something different to get a new result. And so we need to live at cause rather than at effect. Look at look what the Bible says about this in Luke chapter 19, verse 13. This is interesting. This, this by the way, is a parable to town. I don't have time to go into the whole thing, but here's just the gist of it. Basically, Jesus is talking and walking along with his disciples. He says, let me give you an example of what the kingdom of God is really about. The kingdom of God, by the way, when you see that phrase in the Bible, that just means God's agenda. God's agenda for the world. The kingdom of God is like this. And he gives an illustration. And here's the illustration. He says, this master comes to his two or three employees, basically, and says, here's some money. Here's 20 bucks for you, 10 bucks for you, 5 bucks for you. Go invest this. Multiply it. I'll come back and see how you did. Okay? And so this is the phrase that, that he uses here in Luke chapter 19, verse 13. He says, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Look at the English Standard Version. He puts it this way. Engage in business until I come. And so we are supposed to be engaged in business until Jesus comes back. Now, for those of you who think, well, I'm not really a businessman. I mean, I, I understand that those who are business people, that makes sense to them. But, you know, you may say, Pastor Bill, I'm an educator. I'm not really in the business. Actually, you are. You're engaging in the business of educating the next generation. You say, well, no, I'm in healthcare. No, you're engaging in the business of bringing healing to people's bodies. Well, I'm a psychologist. You're engaged in the business of helping people clear their minds. In other words, whatever it is that you do, I'm a pastor, which means I'm engaged in the business of helping you grow closer to Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? And so all of us are about the business that God has given us to do. And so business does not always mean making money. It may mean that. Business means doing whatever God called you to do. If you're in the military, you're engaged in the business of protecting our country. Whatever it is that you do, you need to fully engage, which means go proactive, which means get involved in your life at another level. Some of us need to stop and not just live in our lives, but stop and work on our lives instead of just working in our lives. And say, how can I improve my life? What can I do better? It's time to go pro. And to go pro means you get actively involved in what's going on in your life. What I'm trying to say is if you want this year to be radically different, then be radically different. That's the answer. I really am convinced that God wants this year to be set apart for you, which means you have to be set apart. You have to live at a higher level. You've got to go pro in your life. Whatever it is that you do, see yourself as a professional. Yesterday I was, I was uh, out with my wife. We were having some lunch, and it got to be about 2 o'clock, and this is pretty normal for me on Saturday afternoons as I start, start mentally preparing around noon, and then uh, sometime around 2 or 3 is when I come into the office and actually start getting physically prepared as well to preach my first message on Saturday night. And so it's about 2 o'clock, and my wife just knows my internal calendar is, is ringing, it's going off, because she knows it's time. And I'm, I'm just talking to her about just casual little stuff, and she goes, hey, don't you need to get to the office? And I said, yes. And then she goes, you're making me nervous, you need to get there now. And I turned to her, and I didn't mean this arrogantly, and don't take this wrong, but I really, I said this to her, and I meant it sincerely, not bad, not that I think I'm all that, but I just said, hey, I've done this a time or two. Because she was nervous, and I said, I got this. I said, I really, I don't mean this bad, but I said, really, I, 
I've done this. I know what I'm doing in this area. I'm not trying to say I have it all together and I can't learn. I still need to grow and I've got a long way to go. And there are certainly people doing a lot better than I am at pastoring a church. But I said, but you know what? I've done this. I said, you don't need to be worried. I got this. Because in other words, I knew where my calendar was. I knew what time it was. I knew how much time I had. I knew I had. I have a routine I go through. There's certain music I listen to. I have a prep I get ready for. There's certain things I go through. Why? Because any pro has a pregame ritual. Do you have a pregame ritual before you walk into door at work? If you don't, you're probably not treating it like a pro. Do you have a pregame ritual before you make that next phone call for that next sale you're trying to make? If you don't, you're probably not treating it like a pro. In other words, if you're going to go pro at what you do, you should have some pregame rituals that you go through because your life is worth taking the time to get it right. It's time to live at a higher level and go pro. Does this make sense? Well, pastor, I'm just a student. I'm in college. I'm in high school. No, go pro then. Be a pro student. Well, you know, this sounds great, but I'm a stay-at-home mom. I got three little kids. Oh, no, be a pro mom. That's really important. That's one of the most important jobs in the entire universe is raising the next generation. You definitely need to go pro if you're a mom staying at home. That's a very important role. He said, what do you mean go pro? You know, let's just say, you know, the husband who says, you know, I'm trying to just improve my marriage, and you're talking about all this business stuff today. I mean, I just want to be a better husband. Oh, no, we need to go pro then, because what if one day you come home and your wife says, you know, honey, I've been watching your performance, and you just have been subpar. So here's what I did. I called up a temporary service. I'm bringing a professional husband in to just run <laughs> things since you're not getting the job done. And so I'm going to have him come in and see, she's going to have a resume list of what she's looking for. Well, I'm looking for someone who's qualified in this area and does this and, and they treat me this way. In other words, there's certain listings that she would have if she was going to go hire a professional husband to come in. And you realize that all those things on this list, you already signed up for, dude. You already agreed to all that when you first got married. And so it's time to just go back and be pro again. Does that make sense? It's time to go pro. Be a pro husband. Be a pro wife. Be a pro parent. Be a pro employee. Be a pro volunteer. It's time for us to go pro in whatever it is that we do. we got to fully engage in what God is calling us to do. Mary Kay Ash is, is very well known in the cosmetics industry. Uh, she passed, of course, but she said this great quote. She said, give yourself something to work toward constantly. I love that. You know, pros are always working towards something. Give yourself something to work towards constantly. Are you working towards a goal? In other words, do you have, what is your playoffs? You know, we're entering the NFL playoffs. I love this time of year. It's one of my favorite times of year to watch all the teams but mine. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so the thing is this, uh, we need to go pro, which means we're aiming towards a goal. Every team is like, I want to make the playoffs. And to get the playoffs, I want to go to the Super Bowl, right? They're always trying to go for the next level. What is the next level for you? If you're going to be a pro, you should have a next level. Whatever that is for you, are you going for the next level in your life? What is that for you? It's different for everyone, but go pro. You know, we're working right now on having a San Antonio campus. You know what? We're not just going to have a San Antonio campus. We're going to go pro with it. It's going to be a nice, quality, awesome campus that will compete with any church around us. And there are some great ones there, by the way. But we fully plan on having a pro campus. Why? Because we want to send a loud and clear message that we believe evangelism is the most important thing in the universe, and so we're going to make sure our campus matches that. Does that make sense? Why? We're going to be pro. Are you pro in your life? Are you pro in your plans? Are you planning your life in such a way to take it to that next level? I heard about this banker. He went to this guy. He said, hey, man, your, your finances are a mess. You're overdrawn in your account. Your loan's back due. What's the deal? And the guy says, ah, sorry, my wife, it's, it's, it's her. She just spends so much money. He says, well, why don't you talk with your wife about overspending? you got to talk to her. And he goes, to be honest with you, I'd rather argue with you than her. That's why. And so, you know, <laughs> you're not going pro in your relationships then. you got to be a pro. And a pro sits down and gets proactive if there's a problem. If there's a problem with spending in the relationship, if there's a problem with morality in the relationship, if there's a problem with someone just slacking off in the relationship, you know what a pro does? They sit down and say, hey, let's have a meeting. We need to have a talk. We need to talk about this right now. This is not okay. A pro gets proactive. A pro means leadership. Leadership means you cut the problem off at the past before it becomes a crisis. Did you catch that? So a problem uh, doesn't just sit there. See, people who aren't leading their own lives just sit there and go, well, I've got, the prob I've got this problem. And I always say, what are you going to do about it? Well, I don't know. I'm just, no, I'm, I'm just going to sit around. I don't know. I'm just going to see what happens. Oh, you're going to be, you mean at effect rather than at cause? How do you turn your marriage around? You get at cause. You go, and we need to have a talk. 
I just really feel like we're drifting emotionally, and I feel like we're not connected anymore. We need to change that. What can we do? Well, maybe we can start having a, a once-a-week date night. Maybe we can start talking at night. Maybe we can just start having a, a quick little minute-long prayer time at the end of every evening, just something to connect our hearts back together so we feel close again. You know, let's get proactive. Go pro. God is leading all of us to go pro in our lives. Man, I really just don't feel close to God. Go pro in your prayer life. You've been casual about it. It's time to get serious about it. Get a journal. Get a location. You always stop and you pray every day in a certain spot in your home with a certain Bible sitting there waiting for you, with a certain marker in it that tells you how far you've read and what you're going to read next, and with a journal that you're going to write down your prayers. Go pro in your prayer life. You understand where we're going here? It's time to take it to the next level in every area of your life. That's what God's leading us to do. Now, this is really important. If you will do what I'm going to talk about next, you will truly be a pro. Because this is a rare thing. If you will do this next point, it will change your life more than anything. This is the one thing that has changed my life more than anything professionally for sure, but also even personally. What I want to talk about next. Check this out. Proverbs 27 says this. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Basically, it's better to have someone tell you the truth rather than someone who tells you what you want to hear. That's what that means. I'd rather have someone who will, who will be honest with me rather than someone who lies to me. Look at, look at Psalms 145 verse 4. It says, one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. So we're supposed to have one generation pouring in to the next generation. So, so an older generation should be teaching and instilling certain values in the younger generation. And according to this, this Proverbs 27, they should also be honest about it, about how we're really doing Okay, so we should be open to this. Look at this, look at this principle in action in Titus chapter 2. It says, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled. It goes on and on, talking about all these things they should do. And so, so the Bible talks about older men teaching younger men. We see this all throughout scripture. Paul, you know, taught Timothy, right? We see this over and over. Moses taught Joshua we, over and over, right? But also all throughout scripture it says older women are to teach Younger women. Now, it doesn't say older men are to teach younger women. A lot of men try to sign up for that. Nowhere does it say that. It says older women are to teach younger women. The problem in our church, I can't find any woman to admit that she's older to actually teach the younger women. That's the problem we're having right now. The point is this, though. We're supposed to have the older generation pour into the younger generation. This is really a big deal. What does this mean for you and me? If you want to really radically change your life, can I tell you something right now? It won't change until you do number two. Get coached. Your life will really not change until you're open to coaching. We should all get coached up. Getting coached up means that you find someone that's really better at what you want to do than you are, and you say, how can I improve my game? What can I do to become a better fill-in-the-blank? What is it for you? A better salesman. If you're in sales and you're in the middle of the pack and there's someone who's killing it in sales in your office, why haven't you taken to lunch yet? Why haven't you asked them what their routines are, what they're doing differently than what you're doing? Why haven't you had them sit there while you're making that cold call and they're right in front of you and the person on the other end doesn't even know they're there and they're listening to every word you're saying and when you hang up you say, how was that? And they say, here's what I would do differently. You're getting coached up. Being coached is so critical. In fact, I take it so serious in my life that I pay coaches and I highly recommend you do the same thing. I recommend that you pay a coach. Some of you are like, you're, you're kidding me, right? You want me to spend money for someone to tell me what I'm doing wrong. Absolutely the best money you'll ever spend. Now, you don't have to pay money, but I recommend it at a certain level you'll begin to because when you start to value it, you'll realize it changes your life so much that you will gladly pay money, even big money. I go way out of my way to be coached. I will fly halfway across the country for a one-hour lunch with the right pastor because that one pastor can completely change my life. One time I was told that I may get 20 minutes with Rick Warren. Now, some of you guys don't know who that is, okay, but he's a pastor, and he's doing pretty good, and he's got an incredible ministry, and I thought, if I could get 20 minutes recording, that'd be worth my time. So I flew out with the maybe that I might see him, but I would at least get with his other guys. So I flew out, and my wife and I, we were there, and he came traipsing through the office with a wagon. It was the funniest thing ever. He's pulling a wagon. I was like, where's he got a wagon? He's got a wagon, and he carries his books, and he's always taking books home and, and back to the office. Which I thought, ah, oh, I so relate to that. I do the same thing. Because books are like to mechanics. The mechanics tools are books to a pastor, you know. So I totally get that. And he was wheeling. He goes, hey, Bill, what's going on? Even though he knew who I was at the time. And so I'm like, oh, it's the Protestant Pope. It's Rick Warren. You know, I'm freaking out, you know. <laughs> now I know him, and I realize he's a human, you know, just like all the rest of us. 
But I'll never forget, he said, you know, I haven't eaten yet. Let's go grab some tacos. I was like, he loves tacos. He's my man. <laughs> so we went and we had tacos. In an hour and a half lunch, I probably got the equivalent of a master's degree in leadership. Does that make sense? massively worth my time to go there. You say, well, how much did that cost? Well, to fly there? And I'll, oh, oh, a lot. Totally worth every penny. I didn't even pay him. He didn't ask for it. He, if he would have, I certainly would have. He's the kind of guy that never asked for that, but, but I would do it. There's a guy uh, that was a young pastor, grew up in the Methodist church, and uh, he, he realized that he really wanted to impact the nations w- as a pastor. So he, he wrote a letter. Somehow he got some kind of list that was the top ten largest churches in America at the time. This is in the 70s. And he wrote letters, because there was no email back then. He wrote letters to all ten of these pastors' offices and said, my name is so-and-so, can I come take you to lunch? I'll pay you $100 if I can take you to lunch. Now, $100 in 1970 would be $1,000 today. That's a lot of money. So these pastors were all like, when their secretary said, Hey, uh, someone just wrote you a letter. It's a young pastor. Just wants your time for one hour. Wants to pay you $100. They're like, yeah, tell him to fly in. If you'll come all the way for that, you know, it's very flattering. So they're like, sure, we'll do it, right? So uh, he, said, he said later on when he wrote about this, 80% of those pastors by the end of lunch would always say, I don't need your money. I'm just, I can't even believe you would even ask that. So just, you know, uh, just thanks for, for even considering my time worth your, your flying all the way here. So let's just talk. And he just gave him free advice. That guy became one of the, pastored one of the largest churches in America by the end of his run as a pastor. And now, by the way, his name is John Maxwell, and he's, he's sold 19 million books on leadership. I think it paid off. I think it's going to work out for him. So apparently getting wisdom is a big deal. Getting coaches is a big deal. Because here's the thing. If you're teachable, everyone will want you on their team. If you're not teachable, I don't care how gifted you are, no one will want you on their team. If you're not teachable. Does that make sense? Being teachable is a very big deal. I don't care how skilled you are. If you're not teachable, if you're arrogant and you're not open for correction, nobody wants you on their team. Just go ask Terrell Owens about that. Doesn't matter how many skills you have. Doesn't matter how talented you are. Arrogance causes people to run from you. Humility, teachability causes people to flock to you. Everyone's looking for someone who will humble themselves and say, how can I get better? Can I tell you the number one coach you already have? This is going to shock you because you probably don't think of them as a coach. But here's the number one coach you already have. Your authority. Whoever's in your authority, that's your coach. And, and the problem is the reason we don't get further in our business or in our jobs is because we don't see them as, as a coach. But if you'll go to your boss and say, hey, I really want to become your best employee. I want to become the best in, in, in what I do. How can I blow your mind? What would I have to do this week to just level you emotionally, just to freak you out with how happy you are at what I'm doing. What would I have to do? First of all, they're going to pass out because they've never even been asked that question before. <laughs> but then whenever they finally realize someone's not looking at them as, as Mr. Evil, right, who's just there to tell them when they're doing something wrong, but actually that someone's supposed to come alongside them and help them, they will gladly tell you what it takes to be an A player. And when they tell you, do it. It's as simple as that. Get coached up. It really will change your life. And look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 3 through 7. It says this. It says, a soldier on duty doesn't get caught up in making deals at the marketplace. He concentrates. Would you underline that? He concentrates on carrying out orders. An athlete who refuses to play by the rules will never get anywhere. It's the diligent farmer who gets the produce. Think it over. God will make it all plain. In other words, if you're in war, you shouldn't be thinking about business, right? Nothing wrong with business, by the way, but there is something terribly wrong with business if you're in the middle of a war. That's what it's saying. If a soldier shouldn't be getting involved in civilian affairs, in other words. You shouldn't be getting involved in other things. If you're a soldier, focus on that. If you're, if you're in business, then focus on being in business. If you're in the ministry, focus on being in the ministry. What are you doing, and are you focused? You know what, what, what oftentimes happens? Is that we end up at work thinking about home, and then because we thought about home while we were at work, then we had to bring our work home with us. And then we're at home doing work. But if you'll just focus on where you are at the time, you can get all your stuff done. So when you're at work, work. This may really shock you. Ready for this? I'm going to say that again because it's going to blow your mind. It will change the marketplace forever if you do this. When you're at work, work. <laughs> Some of you are like, wow, I never thought about that. <laughs> I just thought I was supposed to go on Twitter and go on Facebook and check out the latest YouTube video. I had no idea I was supposed to work. Yes, when you go there, you should work. You know, it's, it's, it's sad to say this, but the average worker doesn't do this. But if you will really focus on your number one objective at work, huh, you'll change everything in your life. It really can change everything. Look at it says in Matthew chapter 6, 33. It says this, but seek first the kingdom of God. That's God's agenda. Seek first God's agenda and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If you'll just focus on what God says the main thing is for you, 
then everything else will be added to you. I worked when I was in college. My last year of college, I got married. So I was, uh, I, one, one year out of four, I was married. And my grades went straight up, by the way, when I got married. It's like everything just changed immediately when I got married. I got real serious all of a sudden because I was in love and, and, and got married. And so my grades went straight up. Again, my wife makes everything better, and so, including my grades. And so I, I was working hard. I was taking 18 hours. I was working three jobs at the same time because I didn't care. I was in love. I was like, I'll work as long as I have to for this girl. And so I worked all these hours at these minimum type paying jobs. And so one of the jobs I got, because I was just trying to make the bills, you know, make, basically meet, meet the ends, make, make the ends meet. Sorry, I'm a professional speaker. I'm stumbling all over myself here. <laughs> so basically, I was trying to make everything work financially. So I got a job at the local mall where I was going to college at Radio Shack. Is that hilarious or what? So I worked at Radio Shack. Just imagine me in a little Radio Shack uniform. It was amazing. <laughs> so here I am working at Radio Shack. I know nothing about electronics, but I just knew I needed to make some money, and they were hiring. So I went to work there. It didn't take me but about two weeks to figure out that there was one thing that all the people in the radio shack were making money on. It was called cell phones. Now, this is when they were brand new. And so uh, someone told me, hey, do you know there's spiffs on these? I said, what in the world is a spiff? They said, a spiff is 50 bucks that you make for every cell phone that you sell because they're selling the contracts. I said, you're kidding me. 50 bucks is huge money. I was in college. That is massive money. I was like, oh, my goodness, that's awesome. So this is what I did. So there's people are just working just kind of casually all over the place. And so I just made a point that I always stood right by the cell phones. That I never left. <laughs> I mean, I just, it, if I was on a bathroom break, it was the only reason I was not by the cell phone. So I just stood by the cell phones the whole time. No one else figured this out. I don't know why they didn't. I was like, look, this is where the money's at. So I'm going to go stand right by where the money's at. Okay? So I just stood there. And any time anyone even came near my atmosphere, I'd say, hey, you interested in a cell phone? And they'd say, oh, I'm thinking about it. I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'd ever use it. Oh, I think you're going to be big. Come on over here. Let me show you. You know, so I started showing the cell phone. I'm really dating myself with everyone who's under, like, 20 right now. They're like, what? You know, I know. We barely had electricity back then, too. It was crazy. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm standing by the cell phones, and I would sell these cell phones. Well, here's what happened. I, do, I wasn't even trying. I, I, I was not an expert in anything about this. But just by doing that, I became the number one salesman in the region. And this was also considered the Houston region, even though it was in Nacogdoches, which is way far out of the Houston region. So a 140-mile region, and I became number one salesman two months in a row. After that, I, I graduated, and we moved to Fort Worth, where I was going to go to seminary. And, uh, and because the corporation, Radio Shack's corporation, is owned by Tandy, they, they're located in Fort Worth, my boss called her boss. Uh, who then called his boss that works at Tandy and said, you need to interview this guy. And I said, I'm not really interested, but I'll at least go to the interview. I mean, I don't know. You can offer me something crazy. Who knows? And so I went, and they offered me a full package, full job. I freaked out at the amount of money they wanted to pay me, all because I stood by cell phones. <laughs> and you know what I learned? A little bit of concentration will open all kinds of doors for you. I wasn't even trying. I could have been a Radio Shack stud. It wasn't about that job. It was about whatever you do, focus on what matters. What is it that you do, focus on what matters the most. You know what's crazy? What this means, by the way, number three, is to do less to achieve more. One of my favorite things to do every year, by the way, I do this at the beginning of every year, is I make a not-to-do anymore list. We all make to-do lists. I like to make a not-to-do anymore list. Here's the things I'm not going to do anymore so I can focus on what matters the most. So we should always have a not-to-do-anymore list that we create. What's, your, what's on your not-to-do list? It's very important. Professionals have long not-to-do lists, and they hire other people to do it. Because they're so good at what they do, they get paid more, and they hire people to do all the things they don't want to do. That's how you know you're a pro. So I want to challenge you to consider that. It really can change your life. You know, if, if, if you put a football in my hands, it's worth about 30 bucks. You put a football in Peyton Manning's hand, it's worth about... $15 million a year. If you put a basketball in my hands, it's virtually useless in my hands, by the way. <laughs> you put that same basketball in Kevin Durant's hands, it's worth about $30 million with a $100 million Nike contract on top of that. You put a baseball in my hands, it is completely useless. <laughs> you put a baseball in Alex Rodriguez's hands, it's worth $20 million a year. You put a slingshot in my hands, and it's just a toy. You put a slingshot in David's hands, and it's his key to the palace. You put nails in my hands, and I could maybe, you know, nail up a, a window or maybe a, a door frame. You put nails in Jesus' hands, and he'll save the world. So here's my challenge. What should be in your hands? There's something that when it's in your hands, it's worth way more. There's something that you do that you're gifted at 
Some of you, if I put a nail gun in your hands, oh man, you're worth way more with what you can do with it. Some people, we put paper in your hands. Some people, we put people in your hands, and you manage them so well and so effectively. What is it for you that when we put it in your hands, you can do great things with it? Figure that out, and you'll be right in the middle of the purpose that God called you to do with your life. My last question for you is this. Have you put your life in God's hands? Because if you'll do that, it changes everything. Would you bow your heads with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Would we just take a moment to pray right now? Have you put your life in God's hands? Here's how you do that. The Bible's really clear. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the price for your sins, your sins and for mine. He took the nails in his hands. He hung on a tree. He hung on a cross, gave his life in a gruesome death to pay the price for all of our transgressions, all of our sins, all the things we've done wrong. Then Jesus rose again from the grave after he had died, proving that he is God. No one has done that. He's the one. He's the Messiah. Now he waits for you to individually receive him in your life. You can pray a simple prayer and receive Christ right now. Would you pray this prayer with me? You can say, dear Jesus, I realize I need you in my life. I believe you died on the cross for me. You paid the price for my sins, and I believe you rose again from the grave, proving that you're God. And now I ask you, I invite you to come to my life, change me from within, be my Lord, and be my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Isn't God good? His word is so true.